Hello everyone, I'm Megan Griffin, Senior Program Officer at ACRL. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar offered as part of ACRL's Together Wherever virtual event. Our goal for these webinars is to bring our colleagues together to discuss ways to best meet the needs of the library community during this uncertain time and beyond. As you may be aware, academics are being asked to pause their teaching, research, and service activities today as part of hashtag shutdown academia and hashtag shutdown STEM. Our ACRL Together Wherever programming is being offered in support of education and action in response to ongoing systemic anti-Black racism and Black Lives Matter. Thank you for joining us as we learn, grow, and enact change as a community. If you would like at this point, please feel free to type a brief introduction of yourself and say hello in the chat box while I go over a few reminders. As previously mentioned, today's session is being recorded. We'll post the link to the recording on the ACRL Together Wherever website and also on the ACRL YouTube channel. The ALA Statement of Appropriate Conduct applies to all ACRL events, including virtual events, and we encourage respectful discourse on Twitter using hashtag ACRL Together 2020. Today's presentation will be 90 minutes in length, including a Q&A, and we'll leave the Zoom room open for an additional 10 minutes after the presentation for optional networking and additional questions. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to post your questions in the chat box as they will be compiled for the Q&A at the end. When you choose to depart today's session, you'll see a brief evaluation, and we greatly appreciate your thoughts and feedback. Thank you so much in advance. Today's webcast is the 2020 ACRL President's Program, Shifting the Center, Transforming Academic Libraries Through Generous accountabil Accountability. I'd like to thank our presenters, Mackenzie Mack and ACRL President Karen Monroe for being with us today. Presenters, please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Megan. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, everybody. I'm Karen Monroe. Associate Dean of Libraries, Learning and Research Services at Simon Fraser University and the current president of ACRL. My pronouns are she, her. I am delighted to welcome you to the 2020 ACRL President's Program. I want to acknowledge that I am sending to you all from what is now Vancouver, British Columbia on the unceded lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam people. I'm grateful to have lived much of my life on these lands which were never given, sold or legally transferred from Coast Salish people. Acknowledging land ownership is part of Canada's effort to reconcile with our colonial history and its current ongoing effects and structures. I find the theme of today's program to be highly relevant to this work. And I encourage all of us to consider the history and ownership of the land we in our libraries occupy and the need for accountability that implies. Next, it is my pleasure to honor some of the best and brightest in our profession. ACRL's 2020 award recipients. Although the situation prevents us from celebrating your achievements in person this year, I'd like to take some time to recognize these individuals and institutions for their outstanding accomplishments and contributions to academic librarianship. First up is the 2020 ACRL Academic Research Librarian of the Year Award. Please join me in congratulating this year's recipient, John E. Umschneider, Dean of University Libraries and University Librarian at Virginia Commonwealth University. Sponsored by Gobi Library Solutions from EBSCO, the Academic Research Librarian of the Year Award recognizes an outstanding member of the library profession who has made a significant national or international contribution to academic or research librarianship and library development. The award is the highest recognition that an individual librarian in the academic or research library profession can receive. John Umschneider exemplifies academic and research librarianship through his decades long career as a champion of innovation and inclusion. Under his leadership, Virginia Commonwealth University developed spaces and resources that meet the needs of contemporary students and the evolving academic research university. John helped guide the launch of the Open Textbook, Textbook Network Consortium in Virginia. And at VCU, he invested nearly $80,000 to underwrite and support VCU faculty redesigning their courses to use affordable course content and led VCU in adopting and supporting open community tools and services. A strong advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
John has encouraged the development of community programming focused on race, social justice, and religion, including 17 years of Black History Month lectures celebrating African American experiences and achievements, and 34 years of Brown's Lions lectures on some of the most important topics in the Jewish culture and faith. As a culmination of John's efforts, VCU Libraries also received the 2018 ACRL Excellence in Academic Libraries Award. Congratulations, John. Next, it gives me great pleasure to recognize the three recipients of ACRL's 2020 Excellence in Academic Libraries Award, Nevada State College, Santa Rosa Junior College, and the University of Maryland. Sponsored by Gobi Library Solutions from EBSCO, this award recognizes the staff of a college, community college, and university library for programs that deliver exemplary services and resources to further the educational mission of the institution. Nevada State College's Mary Dean Martin Library, located in Henderson, Nevada, was selected in the college category for its transformation into the first digital academic library in Nevada and its dedication to textbook affordability. Santa Rosa Junior College Libraries, located in Santa Rosa, California, was selected in the community college category for its dedication of services to its campus community to decrease the equity and access gap. The University of Maryland Libraries, located in College Park, Maryland, was selected in the university category for its contributions to digital humanities scholarship and its engagement with students, faculty, and outside partners. Congratulations to all of these outstanding libraries and the staff that have made these achievements possible. Finally, I am very pleased to be able to honor this year's QC Atkinson Memorial Award recipients, Beth Danker, George Makovec, and Rose Nelson of the Colorado Alliance of Research Libraries. This award, which is jointly sponsored by ACRL, Elects, Lita, and Lama, is given to a librarian or librarians who have made significant contributions in the area of library automation or management and have made notable improvements in library services or research. As noted by the award committee chair, these individuals exemplify the spirit of the Hugh C. Atkinson Memorial Award through their understand, outstanding contributions toward the improvement of library services. Their collaborative and innovative work in library automation has had a broad impact on the library profession beyond the Rocky Mountain region, particularly in the development of Gold Rush, a collection assessment and electronic resource management system used by libraries nationally and internationally. Together, they provide a model for consortium management in their delivery of patron-centered library services and efficient library services systems. So congratulations to Beth, George, and Rose, and again to all of our Division Award recipients. For more information on these recipients, as well as on ACRL's many section awards, I encourage you to visit the ACRL Awards website. That concludes the business portion of our session, and so now it's my pleasure to begin the President's Program. This program is the result of the superb work of the ACRL President's Program Committee, which includes Chair Anne-Marie Dietering and members, Reed Garber-Pearson, Elisa Jackson-Porter, Sarah Costalecki, Keahiahi Long, Amanda Meeks, Michelle Santamaria, and Megan Watson. Members of the Planning Committee, please accept my sincere appreciation for all you've done over the past 18 months. It's never simple or quick to plan a program as ambitious as this one, and it's an even taller order in the context of current global events. The Program Committee has worked thoughtfully and with dedication to ensure that even under the current circumstances, this important program could not just happen, but be brought to life with care and enriched with thoughtful Twitter chat discussion in, in partnership with the great folks at hashtag CritLib. If you are a frequent follower of ACRL President's programs, you may have sensed a theme emerging. The last few years of programs have focused on different aspects of equity, diversity, and inclusion, or EDI, which is a core commitment of ACRL. In 2018, a terrific panel focused on critiquing narratives of resilience in library work, taking into account the oppressive impact of structural inequities. In 2019, Dr. Angela Spranger spoke about EDI in organizations and why people stay in organizations that do good work in these areas. This year, we are offering another lens on EDI in our work by investigating ways in which we can productively and even generously explore real accountability for systemic inequities. I cannot think of a more timely topic for us to dive into 
given the extremely tumultuous and painful times we are living through, both in terms of the COVID-19 virus, its unequal health, financial, and social effects on people around the world, and in respect to international protests against anti-Black racism and particularly racist policing practices. Accountability is on all of our minds, as it should be. I'm grateful to the ACRL staff and the planning committee for their work that helped bring us here and to all of you for choosing to participate in this important session today. A quick logistical note today, for any questions uh, throughout the session and particularly at the Q&A at the end of Mackenzie's presentation, we're going to use a strategy called progressive stacking. This is a technique intended to give marginalized voices a chance to speak, particularly in an environment where there is a dominant group. What this means is, if you choose to self-identify as belonging to a marginalized group, especially a marginalized racial or ethnic group, and you'd like to ask a question or make a comment in chat, you can choose to include an asterisk at the start of your chat. Our committee moderators are compiling questions and comments and they will pr prioritize those with an asterisk. You aren't required to self-identify, it's just an option. If you'd like to know more about progressive stacking as a way of elevating marginalized voices, I encourage you to look it up. There's a great definition on Wikipedia or you can find your preferred scholarly source. We will do our best to get to all the questions today. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's program, Mackenzie Mack. Mackenzie is an anti-oppression consultant, researcher, facilitator, founder of Hashtag Boundary Work, and former executive director at Art and Feminism. Mackenzie offers organizational training, equity audits, and accessible online workshops on topics such as anti-racism and affirming LGBTQ communities. They were recently named executive director of Affinity Community Services, a Black-led, queer-led organization on Chicago's South Side that works to end the marginalization of Black LGBTQ plus people around the world. You can follow them on Twitter at Mackenzie Mack and find more of their work online at mackenziemack.com. I am now going to pass the met metaphorical microphone to Mackenzie for our program. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so happy to be here. Um, please excuse me, I'm kind of losing my voice a little bit today. So just let me know if I need to sort of raise my voice, if I need to speak louder, and I'll do exactly that. Um, I really just want to say thank you to the ACRL planning committee. Um, I know that we've been planning this for some time and I am so excited that, that we were able to still proceed with this presentation. And I thank you so much for everyone who's here and decided to, to join this, this call. This is probably the most people that I've ever had listening to me at one time <laughs> anywhere. So I think that that is really exciting. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to share my screen just to be sure that everyone can see. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Okay, cool. I see you all can see it well. All right. So again, this, this, the, the theme of this talk is called Shifting the Center, Transforming Academic Libraries Through Generous Accountability. And during this presentation, I'm, I'm going to get into this, this use of the word generous accountability. Um, and I'm going to tell you why, you know, I was for using, using that term within this presentation. Um, and so here's what we're going to do. We're going to sort of like go through a bit of an introduction and then we'll sort of get to that definition. Um, but for those who may have been listening or seeing that word and, and may have been wondering, hey, what do you mean when you say that? Um, we'll definitely cover that in this presentation. So again, as Karen has already introduced me, my name is McKinsey Mack. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, you can also call me Bunny. A lot of people do, including my mama. And I am an anti-oppression consultant, a researcher, a facilitator, um, founder of Boundary Work, the former executive director of Art Plus Feminism. Um, since I was very young, I always had a, a very strong interest in language and communications. And in particular, when I was in high school, I decided that I was going to be an interpreter. So, you know, I took all these language courses in high school, and then I took all these linguistic courses at the University of Chicago and got two degrees in linguistics. Um, and then I became an interpreter and I started working for the state of Illinois, which is where I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, I have to say. For all those folks who I saw were saying they were coming in from Chicago. Hey, Chicago people. Um, but, you know, at that time I decided I would be an interpreter. So I started working for the state of Illinois. And um, what happened 
um, is that on my first, one of my first days, I was sent over to a further, far south side of Chicago. And I live south, but this was further south. And um, I was working with, within a sort of state agency that offered therapy within the homes of families. And these are mostly black and brown people. Um, these are a lot of folks whose first language is not English. And while I was doing that work, I witnessed so much, so many abuses of power between people who were coming into the community, you know, and I think in their minds coming in to serve, to offer service, to help, who were causing so much harm. And as an interpreter at the time, I was told that it was the only ethical choice that I had was no matter what, no matter what was being said, no matter if it was violent or, or harmful, right? Um, or discriminatory or racist or ableist or anything else, that it was my job as an interpreter to interpret it. That, that, would, that, that, that was my choice of ethics. And so in sort of being in that position, um, I decided to sort of leave that, leave that work, which, which probably happened within 30 days, because I really wanted, I love so much being an interpreter, but the reason why I was drawn to that work was because I wanted to help people to connect with each other. Um, and I didn't wanna be a bridge for harm. And I didn't wanna be a bridge for violence. And I wanted to be able to be in a, in a situation, an environment where I could demand accountability, where I could not only hold others accountable, but where I could also be held accountable. So that's where that sort of work comes from and my sort of um, entry point into doing anti-oppression work and into doing work that's specific to like anti-racism. I always like telling, telling that story because I think, you know, it's a good story to tell. So in addition to that, I'm also, as of Monday actually, was appointed the executive director of Affinity Community Services. So this is my shameless plug. And so Affinity Community Services is an organization that works specifically to end the marginalization of Black LGBTQ people globally. And has been an organization that has been doing that work for 25 years, that has been Black led for the entire time, that has been queer led for the entire time, and actually was started by a group of Black lesbians who were tired of being erased. Um, a group of Black lesbians who knew that they were worthy of being visible, of being seen, of being heard, of being respected, of being loved, of being cared for, and, and of being protected. So they started this community in hopes of creating additional communities where folks could be protected, where folks could be really looked after, um, and specifically Black LGBTQ people around the world. What I always like to do when I'm, thank you so much for those who are offering congratulations, I appreciate that. Um, what I always like to do when I'm presenting is, um, and I see Angie put a link in the chat. Thank you, Angie. Angie is actually one of my friends, so Angie is a plant. <laughs> so when, you, when, when I'm doing these kind of presentations, I always like to invite people to tweet at me during the presentation. And that's because I like to be as cognizant of, as possible of neurodivergence as someone who is a neurodivergent person and who is not ashamed of that. Um, and so I know that just because someone is looking at a screen, looking really intently at a screen, doesn't mean that they're fully engaged, right? And just because a person is potentially like taking notes or drawing or like listening to music while they're watching a presentation doesn't mean that they're not fully engaged. I think it means that we receive information in different ways. So if you're the kind of person where you like to do something while you're listening or while you're watching a presentation, feel free to do, you know, whatever feels most naturally, whatever comes most naturally to you. But then also feel free to tweet at me during the presentation. Um, and then, you know, I will see about, see how, if, depending on how many folks tweet at me, I'll see how I can sort of respond to those folks. But I love being able to have that kind of engagement. Um, so someone's asked me to enlarge my presentation, so I'll do that now. Is that better? Okay, cool. Okay, great. Great. Thank you so much for letting me know you needed that. All right. Okay, much better. Great. I'll make sure let's move my, adjust my screen a little bit so I can see everybody. So what I'd like to start off with are some brave space agreements. And brave space agreements, um, it's really a concept that was coined by Nikki Scott Bay Jones, who is a black woman and who is known as the justice doula. I really like brave space agreements, even if, you know, I know that we're, we, you know, are not able to be in the same room together. Right, but still, even within this chat, we're still engaging with one another and we're still sort of like building community. And so when we're doing that, that kind of building of community, I like to be sure that there are some norms just at the very beginning. So all of us have an understanding of what the expectations are, right? Not only for how we're treating other people, but also for how we wanna be treated. So what are some of these race-based agreements that I have? The first is that we agree to struggle against racism, against sizism, against transphobia, 
classism, sex, sexism, ableism, and the ways we internalize myths and misinformation about our own identities and the identities of other people. So if that's a brave space agreement that you agree with, can you put I agree in the chat? And I'll ask you to do that after each of these. to work towards harm reduction, centering those most affected by injustice in the room, even if it means centering ourselves. So we know that we can't guarantee safety to people, right? Even, even if we really want to. Even if we are the most conscious and aware people on the planet, right? Um, which is really no such thing as the most conscious, most aware, because we always have things to learn. But even if we really have a high level of awareness when it comes to marginalization, right? When it comes to, to concepts of justice and injustice, we know we can never guarantee another person's safety. So we agree to work towards harm reduction and to center those most affected by the injustice that we're discussing. And I see folks are agreeing to that. Thank you so much. Um, the third is that we agree to sit with the discomfort that comes with having conversations about race, about gender, about identity, about even if potentially for discussing the nonprofit industrial complex, that might come up, I don't know. But if it does come up, we agree to try our best not to shame ourselves for the vulnerability that these kinds of conversations acquire. And I see we have folks saying, I agree, number three, I agree, number two and three, I agree, I agree, I agree. Lovely to see that. Number four, we agree to value the viewpoints of other people um, that do not challenge or conflict with our right to exist. And that includes with the right of, other, of others to, to exist, right? And I know in a lot of sort of academic spaces, there's often an unwritten rule that all opinions are welcome, right? That all viewpoints are welcome. And for all those folks who are in this call, Black folks, Latinx folks, Asian folks, South Asian folks, right? Um, for all the folks that are on this call, the folks of color, um, I'm, I'm, I probably can, probably with, with almost, you know, um, a 100% ac accuracy, um, know that if you've been in a predominantly white space, you've been in a space where you've been sort of told, either formally or informally, that even if someone is expressing a racist idea, right? And if you're a trans person, it's even if someone is expressing a, a, expressing a transphobic idea, that that somehow means that it's your job or your responsibility to carry that viewpoint and to treat it as if it is a viewpoint that should be honored and respected or celebrated. So we agree to value the viewpoints of other people, but they can't challenge or conflict with our right to exist. And they can't challenge or conflict with another person's right to exist either. So that's number four. Number five, and this is the last one, I should have said the numbers at the very beginning, <laughs> but number five is that we agree that it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to feel uncomfortable when we're discussing complex topics about accountability, about relationships, about justice, about care. So we agree that it's okay to have feelings and it is okay to feel uncomfortable when we're discussing complex topics about accountability, relationships, justice, and care. I like that I saw that someone put, I agree, one through five. I like that. I don't know if you waited until the end to read them all, just to be like, let me just make sure I know what, what this all entails. But if you did, I really appreciate that. So we have all that agreement. Thank you. So this is your welcome into the space. I appreciate you being here. I see some folks saying I embrace. I love embrace. It's one of my most favorite words. Agree to all, agree, agree, agree. So welcome to this space. You know. I love to dance. It's one of the ways that I really like sort of, um, you know, get out my, my anxiety and express my anxiety. So not just getting rid of my anxiety, but also sitting with my anxiety as opposed to trying to like dispose of it or pretend like it's not there. And so I just wanted to use this gift. Don't worry, I'm not about to dance. I had nobody else dance either. <laughs> but <laughs> you can look at this gift, you know, and, and know that I'm expressing that welcome to you. So I wanted to start this presentation with a single statement. And I wanted to start this presentation with a single statement because I want us all to sort of be grounded in something before we get into the rest of the content for the presentation. So what is that statement? That statement is that Audre Lorde was a black lesbian librarian from Harlem. Audre Lorde was a black lesbian librarian from Harlem. And very commonly, especially when we're talking about anti-racism, Audre Lorde is very, very commonly quoted, right? 
we, we, we maybe, maybe you're familiar with some of her quotes and maybe you did not know her name, right? Don't know her, didn't know who she was or you hear the quote many times, but some of them, for example, your silence will not protect you, right? My silence will not protect me. Another is that the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. And there's so many times in which Audre Lorde is quoted and people will talk about her being a black woman, but will leave out the fact that she was a lesbian, right? And it wasn't until recently that when I was researching her life that I found out she was a librarian and I thought, this is what I want to start this presentation off with, right? This sort of understanding or embrace of these um, intersections, right? Um, so Audre Lorde was a black lesbian librarian from Harlem. So I want us to sort of be thinking about that. Um, and I see some people saying they didn't know she was a librarian. I didn't know that either, right? Margaret put at a poet, or Avi put a poet and scholar, exactly. A poet and a scholar, right? A very prominent civil rights activist. If you haven't read Organizing Across Sexualities by Audre Lorde, you should. It's a very short read and it's so good. And one of the most, one of, for me, one of my most quotable, one of the most sort of like quotables that come from that work um, is when she said, I am a black lesbian and I am your sister, right? I'm a black lesbian and I am your sister. So I just kind of wanted to frame that in that way. Now, in the age of COVID-19 and these national uprisings against racism, we could be asking ourselves this question, who are we accountable to? So in the age of COVID-19 and national uprisings against racism, who are we accountable to? Are we accountable to these people? So we have this sign calling for justice for Breonna Taylor. We have another sign that reads, my grandma march, you know, grandmother march for this. And here, 60 years later, I am marching too, shaking my head, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Are we accountable to these people? So we have a sign here that reads, hashtag Black Lives Matter. We have a sign here that on the same sign that reads, hashtag Black trans, trans Lives Matter, hashtag Black Trans Lives Matter, right? Because we don't want to leave out trans people because we know that all these Black Lives Matter. There's another sign that reads of the people that we have, we have lost to police murders, right? So we have George Floyd on here. We have Sandra Bland, we have Breonna Taylor, we have Ahmaud Arbery, right? We have Mike Brown, right? People we've lost to police brutality. Yeah, so are we accountable to these people? Are we accountable to those people? There's a sign here that reads, Black Women's Lives Matter. There's a group of predominantly Black in the very forefront protesters, right, who are pr protesting for their Black lives, protesting for my Black life, and protesting for the Black lives of all the folks on here. And if you didn't sort of realize before, in thinking about all the protests that we've seen happening, not only nationally, but globally, if you didn't realize before that when Black people risk their lives to go out in the street and to protest for Black lives mattering, right, to let people know, to demand that our lives be honored and celebrated and respected, right, to demand that we be safe in our own communities and in any community, whether we live there or not, that we be safe everywhere we go, that there, that's not only a protest that impacts or positively impacts the lives of Black people, that positively impacts the lives of every single person that's on, these call, on this call right now that positively impact a lot, impacts the lives, right? Of every person that's alive right now. Because anti-blackness is everywhere, right? Anti-blackness is everywhere. So I, would, I just kind of want us to think about that. We're thinking about that level of accountability, right? How we're accountable to ourselves, how we're accountable to these people, how we're accountable to our communities, the communities in which we hold power and in which we hold space. But what is accountability? Exactly, right? Because it's a word that we talk a lot about, especially on Twitter, which I, if you go to my Twitter, you know I love my Twitter. But on Twitter especially, there's so many rich conversations about accountability. So what exactly does that mean when we're talking about accountability, right? And so it's a lot of times when I'm thinking about holding someone accountable or being held accountable, I do think about that word sort of like being real with a person, right? Being transparent, um, being open with my feedback, and also being the kind of person that others can come to and be open and transparent with and open with their feedback from me, even if it's something critical that I've done or something critical that I've said, some, something that's critical about what I've said. Rose Rodriguez put showing up and suiting up. Christy McDowell wrote, uh, Manuel Ellis uh, died March 3rd, 2020, Tacoma, Washington, while in police custody. Um, Julie gets the Molly reference from Insecure. So accountability, and this is adapted from the Audre Lorde Project, and it was a national gathering on transformative and community, community accountability, which took place in 2010. 
So this is adaptive from that. And it's this idea that accountability has this direct correlation right with harm. So accountability is preventing, intervening in, responding to, and healing from harm. Accountability is preventing, intervening in, responding to, and healing from harm, right? Have you ever heard accountability be described in that way? Or have you ever thought about accountability in that way? Because I know sometimes when we think about accountability, um, we may not always sort of make that sort of direct jump into thinking about our relationship with harm or into thinking about, right, um, the ways in which we've been hurt, thinking about the ways in which we've hurt other people. So accountability is like, what work are you doing, right? This is about action. What work are you doing to prevent, to intervene in, to respond to, to heal from harm? It's not just about other people. It's also, how are you healing from the harms that have been done to you? Because we all have a socialization, right? We all have a socialization. So we're all, you know, constantly, with, no matter where we are, we're gonna do something, we're gonna say something that's gonna be harmful. I, as somebody who is a, has been, you know, talking about racial justice and anti-racism, anti-oppression and LGBTQ rights for years, you know, I mess up, right? And I harm people. And so in, in thinking about this term of accountability, it's not if harm happens, it's when harm will happen. How are we gonna, how are we gonna intervene in it? You know, how do we prevent it sometimes from happening? Because sometimes we can get in front of harm before it happens. But if we can't, how do we intervene in it? How do we, are we disrupting it? How do we respond to it? And then how are we healing from it and helping others to heal? Rose wrote, I'm accountable for my actions and my healing. Yes, Rose, thank you for sharing that. Sarah wrote, um, that's a wonderful way to give someone, give, to get someone to understand accountability. Yes. Um, Amy wrote, great way to think about it encompasses so much. Andrea wrote, this is, a, this is an accountability relationship to harm. What else does accountability have a relationship with? What else does that accountability have a relationship with? So in thinking about this definition, we know that there's no such thing as a harmless person. There's no such thing as a harmless institution. There's no such thing as a harmless community. And so when you hear me talking specifically about the space of librarianship, I don't want you to hear me saying, you know, the only place where that racism exists, <laughs> right, is in library, libraries, because we know racism is so ubiquitous, right? We know that racism is everywhere. So there's no such thing as a harmless person. There's no such thing as a harmless institution. And there's no such thing as a harmless community. We are all harmful and we all have a choice in reducing that harm or in amplifying it, right? So we're all harmful sometimes and we all have a choice in reducing that harm or in amplifying that harm. And typically, especially as a non-binary person, I'm not really deep into binaries but there are some binaries that do exist, right? I can choose to sort of reduce the harm that I'm doing that I will do because I know that I'm a human being, I'm imperfect. Or I can choose to sort of settle with it, to not address it, right? And by not addressing it, by not owning it, right? By not sort of helping a person this, who's seeking healing to seek healing with me, I am amplifying it. And I'm sort of perpetuating the cycle of harm where people, a lot of people are hurt, a lot of people are, are, are hurting, Right? And there doesn't seem to be an intervention wherein folks are willing to leverage their privilege and leverage their power in order to intervene on that harm that's being done. Accountability is integral. Accountability is intergenerational. Accountability is pro-Black. Accountability is pro-Indigenous. Accountability is pro-Asian. Accountability is pro-Brown. Accountability is pro-queer. Accountability is pro-trans. Accountability is anti-ableist. <laughs> it's accountability is pro-fat. Accountability is pro-healing, right? Accountability is pro-healing. So all these things. But why are we talking about generous accountability within this context, right? Why not just use the word accountability without adding the word generous? And I'm sure a lot of folks saw the title for this talk. Um, when it was first being promoted and thought, but why generous accountability? Why can't we just say accountability, right? Isn't accountability just what it is? Why a qualifier of generous? Well, that depends on who we're talking to and what we're talking about, right? That depends on who we're talking to and what we're talking about. So when we talk, and, and, and so we're we get into this level of what are, who are we talking to? What are we talking about? A lot of what we're talking about, if not almost the, the near majority, we're talking about anti-racism is we're talking about dismantling white supremacy culture. 
And white supremacy culture is the idea, is the ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to black and brown people and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. And that's a, a source from showing up for racial justice. So it's this idea that white supremacy culture, right, socializes all of us. So none of us are immune to the socialization. It socializes all of us to believe that white people and the ideas and thoughts and beliefs and actions of white people are superior to black and brown people and their ideas and thoughts and beliefs and actions. And we know that this country was founded on that, right? This country was founded on white supremacy culture. And I remember when I first started talking about white supremacy culture on the internet and in workshops and folks are like, no, I don't wanna believe this. I don't, you know, I, this feels very extreme using that term, right? Um, but it's not the term that is extreme, right? It's what's actually happening within that system of injustice that's extreme. The fact that white supremacy exists is what is extreme, not the term, right? This is, we're just sort of clarifying that. But that's not all. So we're not just talking about the fact that you know, this country is founded on white supremacy culture. We're also talking about the fact that librarianship as an institution for public education was founded on white supremacy culture. So librarianship as an institution for public education was founded on white supremacy culture, right? And again, there's this reaction of like, mm, I don't, I, this is uncomfortable, you know, right? Um, Justin Rowe, is there a snapping remote, a snapping sort of, I guess, emoji in Zoom yet? I don't think so, I don't know, maybe not yet. So, right, so there might be some folks that are like, ah, that's scary to me. Thinking about the foundation of librarianship as being founded on white supremacy culture, because that feels really big and that feels really scary. Um, and that feels like something that's sort of hard for me to really think about and think through, hard for me to unpack. Folks are saying my gifts are on point. Oh, you already know my gift game. I love gifts. <laughs> so let's talk about the history of public libraries and public education. And this is not going to be completely thorough and this won't be exhaustive because I know I'm talking to librarians. So I know in a, in a heartbeat, y'all will pull out the citations on me and I don't want that. So I'm just gonna say, right, that we're talking about a sort of brief history, not exhaustive, related specifically to racism, right? So y'all don't, you, you don't jump in here with the citation. Shannon wrote, no citation shaming. Yeah, exactly. Remember the brave space agreements. I should have put that in there as well. <laughs> so let's talk about the history of public libraries and public education. Let's track the harm. And this is a term I like to use often, um, especially when I'm thinking about the way that conflict arises within communities of people that are doing anti-racism work, the way that conflict um, arises specifically within organizations, right? The way that conflict arises, conflict and harm, arises specifically within right, library systems in this very specific context. So if we're tracking the harm, what do we know? Well, we, we can begin, right? We can begin with thinking about anti-literacy laws. So between 1740 and 1834, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North and South Carolina, and Virginia all passed anti-literacy laws. South Carolina prohibited teaching slaves, and really want to use the word slaves, we want to say enslaved people, right? Because we never want to use, um, we never want to talk about slavery in such a way um, where we are defining the person or the human being by their oppression in that way, right? Because they're not slaves, these are people. These were people. So, South Carolina prohibited teaching enslaved people, enslaved African people to read and write. And it was punishable by a fine of 100 pounds and six months in prison. And that was via an amendment to the 1739, quote unquote, Negro Act, right? So we know that enslaved people were severely punished and murdered for attempting to learn how to read, right? So that's what we're starting when we're thinking about education and we're thinking about public education. We're thinking about the right to learn how to read. And we also thinking about so many enslaved African people who learn how to read, right? And who hid that so as to save their own lives, right? Who risked their lives to be able to get information, to be able to get knowledge that was completely, completely being taken away from them. So again, we have this historical sketch of Negro education in Georgia. And this is by Richard Robert Wright. Um, and it talks about Savannah, Georgia. And specifically, it talks about a black man in Savannah um, who opened a school, right? 
And in this school, um, black folks were being taught openly. And then what, what, what happened is that um, after December 22nd, 1829, it was thus made an offense, a crime, to teach a black person to read or write, right? It was made a crime to teach a black person to read or write. So if we're thinking about that, this idea of, okay, what's happening on the ground? What's happening in communities of black people who are enslaved, right? Um, and also what's happening in communities of black people who have been quote unquote freed, who are still being denied the right to learn to read, who are still being denied the right to learn to write. So this is a picture of Atlanta's Carnegie Public Library, which was built in 1902. So this library was for um, free, uh, was for white patrons only. So it was only for white people, right? Um, and in 1902, W.B. Du Bois, uh, who was a scholar and activist and was a professor at Atlanta University, right, was very outspoken about this and how unjust this was to have this library be built right and for this have to have this library be for white people only but at that time that was what was commonplace we have a library for white people and maybe later we'll have a, li a library for black people only here's another photograph this is a photograph of hallie b broker who was a guest book reviewer and this is a photo of her doing a story time she was doing a story time for a group of young black readers at the auburn branch of the atlanta public library so Atlanta's first public library branch for African-Americans was the Auburn branch. It was opened in 1921. It was in a red brick building um, at 333 Auburn Avenue. Um, and it was there from 1921 until 1959, right? So there's these now these, these libraries that are being built and these are libraries specifically for black people, right? And we have, now we have book reviewers. We're seeing black librarians who are coming into this space. Right, so we're seeing this history sort of, we're seeing this sort of, this um, history of sort of public education, especially, specifically within black communities, we see the shift, right? Do all this activism work from black people who are ensuring that black communities also have libraries, also have books to read, right? Also are learning how to write, also are, be, are being able to sit down in their own communities, outside on the grass, and attend a story time with a black person who's doing the teaching and when a black, with a black person who's doing the storytelling. This is another story. So um, Mississippi, um, this is a, actually a photo of Ethel Sawyer who was arrested because she was doing a sit-in in a library, an all white library in Jackson, Mississippi, right? Um, so this is 1961. Ethel Sawyer was a member of the Tougaloo Nine and was tracked by the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission because of her civil rights activities. And although many activists at the time were challenging segregation laws through writings and individual action, it wasn't until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s that segregated public libraries would be challenged. Like, hey, you have a library for white people only, right? We wanna be in that library. Why, are you, why is this library segregated? Why don't we have libraries in our communities? Why are we being kept from learning in these spaces, right? Why are we still being kept from learning how to read and write? A person made a really good point here, Alexandra, and wrote, right to literacy is still challenged in court. Caitlin wrote, yes, this is ongoing now. John wrote, historical overview of desegregation of public libraries in the South, the desegregation of public libraries in the Jim Crow South, Wayne Weigand, and Shirley Weigand, Louisiana State University Press. Thank you so much for sharing that. So what are we seeing today? Because you all made a good point in the comments that this is not the past, right? This is not the past. So for example, if I'm making baking a cake and I love a baking a cake analogy. So if you've attended other webinars of mine and you're like, oh my gosh, they're gonna go on with this baking a cake analogy. Yes, I am, because I like it. But if we're baking a cake, right? And I'm putting all these different sort of ingredients in the cake and then I bake it. After I baked it, I can't make it not be a cake, right? So even if I were to sort of crumble it up and put it into a blender, there's no way that I can take any of those ingredients out of that cake. So I can't somehow remove the eggs that have been baked in. I can't somehow remove, right, the milk that has been baked in, right? I have to completely, completely sort of redo that, right? Or, or completely, completely actually create something else in order for me to have something that's not a cake, 
But I can't take, for example, injustice and try to reform it into something else. I have to completely, right, I have to completely change it from the foundation. So we think about now librarianship, we know that according to the American Library Association diversity counts from 2012, that 88% of librarians are white. We know that 73% of librarian assistants are white. We know that nearly three quarters of librarians are white women, right? And I know it's 2020, so potentially some of these numbers have changed, but we still know that librarianship is predominantly white, right? And so when we think about that, the idea of um, the majority of librarians being white people, can we consider the kind of impact that that has on black and brown people? Can we consider the kind of impact that that has on indigenous people, right? Because when you're going to get um, a degree, you wanna become a librarian. We know that studying anti-racism is not on the list of required study for becoming a librarian, right? We know that you're not actually required to learn about such things, for example, as transformative justice, as conflict de-escalation, right? A sort of community building that is founded in anti-racism. So then what, what happens is we have this sort of perpetuation of this harm. And let's not, let's not forget to mention the fact, right, that there's still so much segregation Right? I live in Chicago, which is one of the most segregated cities in the nation. And we know that there's still so much segregation. So even to be able to go to a library that has books in certain in, um, very specific communities that we have uh, might be pretty difficult. When I was growing up, my mom went out of her way to try to get me to a library that had books. And in Chicago, we do have some libraries where you go to the library and a lot of the shelves are empty and it's open and they're librarians, but it's so under-resourced and it's so understaffed. And it's almost as if that building is just being left there to be left there, right? Um, but it's not actually being invested in. So that sort of, that, that disparity um, has continued to grow. It hasn't, it hasn't sort of like, be, we're not a new day in 2020 where suddenly now librarian, libra uh, libraries specifically or library systems are anti-racist. And we're not suddenly living at a time where black and brown people just have all this access to knowledge and information that they, you know, the same sort of access that white people have to have, because that's just not what the reality is. Even to be able to, if you can't go to a library, even to be able to look up information on the internet, you have to have internet, right? You have to have technology. And there's still so many people that don't have that access. So what is white supremacy culture? How does white supremacy culture specifically define accountability. And also Sherry added a really important note here, and three-fourths of library directors are men, right? That's also a really good point. That's also a really good point. So white supremacy culture defines accountability as what? As what? Well, basically nothing, right? Because we, we know that slavery happened. We understand that racism is real, right? Um, we see Black folks now all the time, even before pre-COVID, and even before, right, these national uprisings against systemic racism, these national uprisings against police murders, yeah. we can see, we, we've seen a lot, an, a lot of writings and essays and posts on Facebook and posts on Instagram and posts on Twitter of Black people saying, this is the racism that I'm experiencing. And besides the people that potentially I live with, and even in some cases, maybe even not, but besides the people that I live with, when I go outside my house, I don't feel safe. And everywhere I go, and if, if there are like, if it's a predominantly white space, even if it's not predominantly white, I'm constantly experiencing anti-blackness or I'm constantly experiencing some anti-indigeneity, right? If we're talking about indigenous people, or I'm constantly experiencing folks coming up to me, um, right? And pushing these stereotypes of what it means to be Asian, what it means to be a Latinx person of color, right? What it means to be this, what it means to be that, what it means to be anything but not white. And that's sort of a daily lived experience. And so we know that all this harm is happening and we know that we've experienced so much trauma, right? And specifically as, as um, a black person, a black community, I know my community has experienced so much trauma, but what has our government done to rectify that harm, right? What up to now this moment, this pinnacle moment that we're living in in history right now, what has been done, right, to address those harms? Where is the accountability? So when we use the term generous accountability, we're using it to capture all of us who have internalized the idea that accountability is punitive, that accountability is shaming, that accountability is hateful, 
that accountability is damaging, right? When it's none of those things. So we think that we think, okay, well, if I'm holding someone accountable, right? If someone's, or so if someone says that they want to hold me accountable for something, they're trying to hurt me, right? They're trying to tear me down as a person. They want me to know that I am bad as an individual. And that makes sense why we would think that because we all hold this internalization of white supremacy, right? Given our earlier example, we're talking about enslaved African people who are being punished and sometimes even killed because they're learning how to read and write. So when you grow up in a society like that, that condones that kind of behavior and that condones that kind of violence, right? There's no way that we as, as individuals, that we as communities are gonna be immune to that. But when we, without any knowledge of transformative justice, without any knowledge of anti-racism, without any knowledge of Audre Lord, that we're just gonna walk into a room and our definition of accountability is going to be, oh, accountability is transformative. Accountability is healing. Accountability is us working together in community, right? There's, there's, we're not gonna really have that as a default sort of understanding of what that is. That takes time, that takes knowledge, that takes education, right? That takes research since most of, this, most of this information is not something you just learn if you go to college or just learn if you're in elementary school or in high school. A lot of this are things that you actually, right, have to search for. And thankfully, because of the work of so many activists, right, and abolitionists and educators and facilitators, we have far more information and knowledge around white supremacy culture and around anti-racism and around social justice. And this is knowledge that, you know, we didn't have as readily available as it is now. I want to say even six years ago, maybe even almost four or five years ago, right? So there's been an influx of this knowledge sharing in community. And there's been an influx of this knowledge sharing around a form of accountability um, that is not about harming people, right? It's not about hurting people in order to help them to understand the harm that they've done. Um, and it's not about us being hurt or harmed in order for us to understand the harm that we've done. So we need generous accountability from all of us. We need generous accountability from white librarians and from white administrators, from white leaders and libraries. We need generous accountability from non-Black people of color, right, who are librarians, who are in positions of leadership, right, who are administrators in libraries. And we also need generous accountability from black librarians and leaders in librarianship. We need you to be accountable for your healing. And a lot of times when we're thinking about anti-racism work, I wanna say, which I hope will change within the next year, but I would say maybe in the 90th percentile, most of that content is directed, is directed towards white people specifically, which I understand why that happens. But also I think when we have these conversations, we often leave out talking specifically, right, about folks of color about black and brown people, about indigenous people. And the reality is that all of us have anti-racism work to do because we all are being socialized by the same system. So even with, with, with all the black folks that are in this call right now, yes, we also need generous accountability from you. We need you to be accountable for your healing, right? We need you to be accountable for your healing. So, um, when I was, I got my first job, and actually I used to work at the Chicago Public Library for like four years. So I just wanna share that, you know, so y'all can give me some, some points. I was not a librarian. Um, <laughs> I worked for a, a summer reading program for like four or five years. And um, I remember my mom having a conversation with me about work and about labor. And for her growing up, when you get a job, you keep that job for life. And even if people are, you know, you're experiencing conflict, um, or you feel like you don't have community at work, or you're being mistreated, you still just be happy to have a job, you keep that job for life. And so for me, sort of coming up during a time, right, where if you're a millennial, for example, and you're somewhere for three years, that feels like a really long time. Maybe even depending on the place, one year might feel like a really long time, right? It might feel like a really long time. But coming, in, coming up during that time, I recognize that we still a lot, many of us as black people carry the socialization that when we're in a space, and if, because it's a privilege to be able to have the opportunity, and it's a privilege to be able to have the, the chance to be able to leave a place and go and work in another place, because not all of us have that privilege. But for some of us who actually have that privilege, right, I notice that there's still this socialization of, hey, I'm being mistreated here. My director has said some racist things to me, and they refuse to accept accountability, right? My fellow librarians have said and done some very racist things to me, right? Some abusive things to me. And they have not held accountability and they refuse to hold accountability. 
but maybe it's my responsibility as a black person to stay in this space, to hold this space, you know, and to, to hold it out, right? Um, and, and that's part of sort of socialization, right? It's sort of still that amplification of harm because we still have to be accountable to ourselves for healing. We still have to be accountable to ourselves for the ways in which we're unlearning our socialization around boundaries, right? Where we're erecting these boundaries that actually do protect us, that actually, if we have the privilege, we have the opportunity, that actually do help us to leave places that are refusing to do their anti-racist work. That's where we're at now in 2020. If we have the opportunity to leave an organization or to leave, right, a university or to leave a library where we're being mis mistreated, right? We actually have the privilege to be able to actually have a choice to leave. And we've done all that we can to try to get folks to hold accountability. They won't do it. And it seems like that the more that we try to get them to hold accountability, the more that they sort of increase and amplify that harm. Then we, we, it's up to us to sort of erect this boundary where we actually leave, right? Which I know for many of our folks that can't come before us and many of our ancestors, that can be like, that's so unheard of. It's like, what, you wanna leave a job? Just stay in your job, keep your benefits. Don't move, don't do anything new. Just be happy you have a job. We're now not in that sort of space of survive only. We're in the space of, right, we wanna survive, but even more importantly, we wanna thrive. And so I wanna emphasize here that the greatest harm of this world is white supremacy culture. That, that connects to climate change, that connects to anti-Black racism, right? That connects to the systemic oppression of indigenous people around the world, right? That connects to so many, so many systems of capitalism, systems of fat phobia, systems of size, sizism, systems of transphobia. The greatest harm of, of this world is white supremacy culture. But what does it mean to be accountable for dismantling white supremacy within libraries? And I know I'm coming up on the hour. I'm gonna go maybe just a few minutes over and then we'll do Q&A. So I wanna be sure that you all know that. So what does it mean for us to be accountable um, for dismantling white supremacy within libraries? Well, here are five critical guidelines for doing this work. Here are five critical guidelines for doing this work. And I think it's very interesting that throughout my entire presentation, everything that's been numbered so far has been fives. I think that's cool. I did not do that intentionally, but hey, it sounds, it, it's working out. But here are five critical guidelines for doing this work. The first is that this work is not race neutral. Anti-racism work is not race neutral, right? It's not race neutral. Race neutral approaches to library service are inherently racist because there's no such thing as neutrality when it comes to racism. There's no such thing as neutrality when it comes to racism. So that idea of, I'm gonna do anti-racism work in this space as a leader within, a, within right, the library service. And I'm gonna start off by telling my staff that I don't see color, right? That's like one of the first statements I'm gonna make. So you all know where I stand, I don't see color. That's not a good approach, right? Because we all see color, right? And to sort of um, attempt to ignore the very specific experiences, for example, of Black people, the very specific experiences of Asian people, the very specific experiences of Latinx folks of color, the very specific experiences of Indigenous people, to attempt to try to ignore that and to call that the work is only perpetuating the, the, the system of white supremacy culture, right? It's only perpetuating racism. So that's something we definitely don't want to do. Because we have to understand that diversity without anti-racism Diversity within anti-racism is tokenism, right? That's, let's check a box and let's put as many people that look different, as many people that look different who are not gonna be in positions of leadership and who we think won't challenge us when we say and do things that are incredibly harmful. Let's do that and we'll say that we've done the work, but that's actually not the work. That's actually not the work. Number two, white librarians need to develop an anti-racist analysis. White librarians, and this is like white leaders also in, in the space of library service, right? Need to develop an anti-racist analysis. So this is from Topographies of Whiteness, Mapping Whiteness in Library and Information um, Science. Um, and it says white librarians need to develop an anti-racist analysis and apply it to librarianship. Confront white privilege, it's multiple manifestations um, and it's multiple manifestations and, um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. 
confront white privilege and its multiple manifestations and work in alliance with librarians of color to dismantle inst institutional racism. So white librarians have developed this anti-racist analysis because we really don't know what we don't know. And sometimes as a distancing behavior, and this, is, this goes for all of us, sometimes as a distancing behavior, sometimes we we'll refuse to take in the information because we don't wanna be held responsible. Sometimes we refuse to do the research because we don't wanna be held to an expectation. And that could be for several reasons, the why. It could be because we, we don't wanna fail. It could be because we don't wanna to, want to be committed to anti-racism work, right? It could be, you know, for many, many, many reasons. But we have to recognize that, you know, for those white folks who are on this call, it's actually your responsibility to develop this anti-racist analysis. And although uncomfortable, right, we can learn to sit with discomfort. We can learn to sort of feel discomfort and still continue in the work. And I have to tell you as a certainty the discomfort that a white person feels in doing anti-racism work is nothing like the violence that a black person feels in experiencing racism every day. So how are you developing that, that sort of um, capacity for that discomfort, right? And so here, here you go as a resource, Advancing Racial Equity in Public Libraries. I really like this by racialequityalliance.org. It's so good, I like it a lot. Um, number two is that non-black people of color who are librarians or administrators who are leaders need to develop an anti-racist analysis that is centered in pro-blackness. And that's specific, um, so specific because we have to understand that anti-blackness is so ubiquitous and that technically a person of color, right? So we're talking about a Latinx person of color could be doing anti-racism work, right? And what their, what their sort of like definition of anti-racism work is. And they could be doing it and it's not centered in pro-blackness. So on the surface, it could look like wow, they are really like, you know, doing anti-racism work. They are really, you know, dismantling white supremacy, right, publicly. And then maybe they go home and somebody in their family is saying something negative about black people or saying something negative about dark-skinned people. And maybe this person isn't black, but they're a Latinx person of color and they have a dark skin tone, right? So how, how are we sort of still, again, with accountability? How are we intervening? How are we disrupting? How are we responding to that harm, right? Please feel free to send this presentation to this person. Number, um, and so in addition to that, we're thinking about, oh, somebody said they missed the title of this. So it's, it's uh, Advancing Racial Equities in Public Libraries. If you Google that, um, you'll find it. And it's by Racial Equity, it's on Racial Equity Alliance Network. Um, okay, so moving on. So again, when we're thinking about that, we're thinking about this as an action, action continuum. So actively participating, and oppression, and the continuum goes up to initiating and preventing, right? So from actively participating to holding that accountability, act from actively participating to intervening in racist harm, right? To intervening at the inter intersections of these harms. Number three, black librarians and administrators and library leaders need to heal. And healing also requires study. Healing also requires that we, right? Healing also requires that we, although I'm not a librarian, but I am black, as you know. Healing also requires that we face our internalization of anti-blackness. And so I wanted to include it in here to really, really sort of, oh, Rebecca wrote honorary librarian. I really wanted to include this in here so that you all have this understanding that everybody has anti-racism work to do. And it's extremely nuanced and it is different. The work the, that white people have to do around anti-racism is not like the work that black people have to do. It's not like the work that other folks of color are doing or have to do, right? But we all have to dismantle the socialization of white supremacy culture. And so we think about that idea of healing. We think about when we say Black Lives Matter, are we also including our lives? Are we also resting, right? Are we also taking care of our bodies? Are we also unlearning these ideas that in order for us to be effective, right? Just as people are in sort of like our respective careers, that we have to be perfect, right? Because we have to unlearn that, because we know perfectionism is a pillar of white supremacy culture. So what does that look like for us to unlearn these things and to live a more free and full and whole life? And I'm almost done. Number four is we want to normalize open dialogue about anti-racism. We want to organize staff to develop internal systems of change for racial equity, right, for anti-racism work. And we want to change, update, communicate, retire. And retire means 
that once we realize that there's an existing policy within a, a, a library space, within a library system, right, within a university that is perpetuating white supremacy culture, right, we organize with staff, never alone, always together, in order to see that retired, to see if we can get that erased, to see if we can start again when it comes to these foundational things. Uh, Mary Beth wrote, please take your time. This is so good, it's so important. Okay, I don't wanna go over too much because I know there's questions, so I wanna have time for that. So we wanna normalize open dialogue about anti-racism, organize staff to develop internal systems of change for racial equity, and we wanna change, we wanna update, we wanna communicate, we wanna retire, right? So no one should have to come into a space um, as a black person, as an Asian person, as an indigenous person, right? So Latinx person of color, because we know not all Latinx people are people of color, so I just want to offer that distinction. Um, none of those people, none of us should have to come into a space and feel like we can't speak about anti-racism. And if that's potentially a goal, that's not, that's something that, that's being done if you're a leader who actually has privilege, especially if you have white privilege, and you can work towards organizing staff to make that possible, then that should be one of those goals, that people can come into this space and they can speak openly about anti-racism. Because what kind of space, what do we call a space, um, or what do we call a community or an organization, right? Or a university or a library? What do we call it when we can't go into that space and speak openly about justice, right? What is that called? And why does that make sense to us, that I can't speak openly about justice where I work? That doesn't make sense. So that communication piece, that organizing piece is so critical, right? That speaking to one another, that opening up a space and expanding a space so that we can have these open dialogues, right, is so critical, so important. And then number five, last but not least, we do this work together. We never do this work alone. Even when we heal, right, as black and brown folks, we're focused on our healing. We do this work together. We never do it alone. For the white folks that are doing anti-racism work or who want to do it, there's also healing work that's involved in that. Because you'll recognize if you're at the very beginning of your journey, when you start to really get deep into that information and you start to really understand how those, those, those aspects of white supremacy culture are showing up within your organization or within your life or within your community, right? You do experience loss. You do. Because then you start to realize that there are certain people that potentially you love, who you love and adore, who are people who have white privilege who do not want to do this work. People who have white privilege and who have you know, voices that people listen to, right? Who have the ability to center people that have been marginalized, who don't wanna do it because they don't wanna be disliked, because they don't wanna feel uncomfortable, and because potentially, very potentially, they wanna hoard power and they don't wanna give back power that's been taken away from black and brown people, that's been taken away from indigenous people and been given to them because they wanna hold on to it. So there is loss in that. And so with that loss, we have to remember that we do this work in community, we do it together. If you're just the beginning, if you're in the middle, right, if you're in a place where you feel like you're more advanced, but you do understand that this life won't work, there's a community for you. There's a community for you, people who will support you, people who will back you, and people who understand. So please do not isolate, right? Please understand, like, we're welcoming you into this community. We do this work together. And also, this is what happens when we try to do this work alone. You know, it's just, it's bad. I don't know if you've ever watched Gladiators back in the day, but... <laughs> They can never get past this thing. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but they can never get past this. So we don't want to be the traveler. <laughs> we don't want to be, right, attempting to be isolated and doing this work. Um, I'm sure after this, this person's arms, right, their, their glutes, their abs are just, just on fire, right, because they're trying to do this alone. So I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. We're all worthy of care and protection, of love and safety, of justice and accountability. So we're all worthy of care and protection, of love and safety, of justice and accountability. And so when we're talking about doing work that dismantles the harm and that really builds up these cultures of accountability, where even if, you know, in the words of um, Miriam Kaba, even if we're we have to, you know, fumble towards repair, right? We're still doing it, right? And we're still experiencing that, what it feels like to sort of hold that space for accountability and to hold it for repair. So we're all worthy of care and protection, love and safety, justice and accountability. Now, if you'd like to contact me,
after this. And I know we're still going to do Q&A, so don't think that, you know, I'm running away. But um, you can contact me. You can visit my website at mckinseymac.com. Um, my email is work at mckinseymac.com. My Instagram is at mckinseymac, right? My Twitter is at mckinseymac, right? So I just want to keep that simple so you all can remember. <laughs> so feel free to contact me in these ways. I thank you so much again to ACRL for having me. We will do Q&A. And so I'm guessing potentially we can start that now. Mackenzie, thank you so much. This is Karen. And I think because your screen is shared that no one will see my face, but I have just an incredible expression right now of um, I have to compose myself. That was the most fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. That was such an amazing, um, I think, actualization of our topic, generous accountability, incredibly generous. And thank you so much for sharing with us. You taught us about our own profession, about Audrey Lord. We, know, we all know now that we need to be studying anti-racism in our library degrees. Uh, you've offered us some concrete ideas for how we can move forward in this work uh, and some guidance and guidelines for doing that. Um, I am going to, just to make sure that there's time for questions, I am going to just remind everybody now, uh, there, if you would like to ask a question in chat, committee members and staff are monitoring the chat. Um, if you would like to self-identify as belonging to especially a marginalized racial or ethnic group, you can choose to include an asterisk at the start of your message and we'll prioritize those questions and comments. And uh, we'll try to answer all questions received today. Um, I believe, the, the sort of the hard limit that we have on our time today is that we do need to close out of our room by 20 till the hour. So depending on where you are, it's 2.40 or 1.40 or 12.40. Uh, because there is another session that we'll be starting in using this, this Zoom address. So um, thank you again, Mackenzie. And um, I'll just turn now to the questions that have been shared in the chat uh, by the staff and the committee members. And if it's okay with you, Mackenzie, I will just uh, see what we've got here and, and I'll read to you. I just saw one. Can I, can I respond to one? Absolutely. Thing? Yeah. If you see one that you want to respond to, go for it. Thank you. So Ingrid asks first, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid, for being here. The question is, do you have any words of advice for Black librarian leaders who lead majority white staff to invite staff into anti-racist work? And by majority, I mean only one staff member is Black. Um, so yes, I do. Um, if there is, if, you know, there is budget to bring someone in to start to open up a dialogue around anti-racism, I would very much recommend that. Sometimes what people have done, which I've seen done before, um, is that if it's a, a black person who's leading a majority white staff, they might um, attempt to take on some of that teaching on their own. That I would recommend against, only because that's not your job and that's not emotional labor that is for you to do. Um, in addition to that, I think that um, it, it helps to sort of, as we're, we're doing this work, to understand that even if you're a Black librarian leader, right, you also deserve to be in the room and to be learning, right, to be learning about how you're dismantling your own sort of levels of, of anti-racism and how you're dismantling white supremacy culture personally and then also within the work that you do. So for me, it would be, is there a possibility of someone in your town or your city um, who is, um, he does specifically anti-racism work. I always recommend that there's at least one black facilitator, one white facilitator to come in and, and engage that discussion or to engage folks in that discussion, I think is important. Did, did you want- Thank you, Mackenzie, that's fantastic. Uh -huh. um, I'll just also maybe note, um, I see another asterisk comment in chat from Nadia, who says she, they are co-leading a breathwork and meditation workshop tomorrow at 7.30, and there is a bit.ly link if anyone would like to uh, participate in that session. Yeah, that sounds lovely. Thank you, Nadia. Okay, more questions. Would you like me to look uh, to see what I've been passed by staff and committee yeah, members? Okay, let's see what else we have in our list here. Um, someone has asked, could you provide more details on what an anti-racist analysis would look like? Sure. Um, so an anti-racist analysis, some of the things that I think about when I think about that are understanding your positionality and understanding what positionality is, 
I have found critical race theory to be especially helpful in understanding what intersectionality is and how it works and potentially how it has an impact not only on us and the ways that we experience the world, right, the ways we experience relationships, but also how our particular positionality um, has an impact on the people that carry less margin or carry more marginalization than we do. So that would be one of the things is what is your positionality, right? And that's several things. That's sexuality, that's gender, right? That's race, that's um, income, right, level. Or so we're also talking about economics, right? That's where you grew up, that's who you were raised by. That's what, what kind of education you have. So having an understanding of what is my positionality is really important. And again, critical race theory, I find to be helpful with that. We know the Kimberly Crenshaw, right, coined the term intersectionality. There was an article that came out um, this year where Kimberly is sort of revisiting that term and talking about how she's responding to the ways in which others have been using that, that using the terminology around intersectionality. Um, so I find that to be helpful. Um, I also think in terms of developing an anti-racist analysis, read, 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 read the works of Angela Davis. Something that I would recommend, which is a work that I love a lot, is a work called um, Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. I like that a lot. I also recommend it organizing across sexualities. That I also highly recommend because then you're getting a sort of perspective from a black lesbian activist, right? Around her own intersectionality and the kinds of impacts or how that impacts her, her lived experience. And also how that sort of shifts the ways in which she experiences marginalization. And so I think, you know, could not recommend enough. Please read the work of black women <laughs> who've done this work and been doing this work. Um, Miriam Kaba, if you don't know who Miriam Kaba is, you can go to transformharm.org, which speaks specifically to potentially what a world would look like without police and prisons. Um, so those are some of the recommendations that I would, that I would offer. Justin wrote, Angela Davis's work is mostly free online. Yes, even Our Prisons Obsolete, I think, is also available online. And Organizing Across Sexualities is available online. Thank you. There's nothing that librarians love more than a reading list. So thank you so much for <laughs> offering us some assignments and some specific places to start. Really appreciate that. And thank you to the committee members and maybe to the staff uh, who are also adding links in to, to yes, provide a quick, yeah. yeah, quick access to some of these resources. I love that. Y'all are so great. <laughs> um, just a reminder, if you do have questions or comments, again, feel free to keep adding them in the chat. Um, it looks like one just came in, although my chat is moving on me a little bit. Um, there's a question in here, Mackenzie, I don't know if you can see this from Rachel. Um, I'll just read this to see if this is something that you have thoughts on. Any thoughts on how to deal with objectionable ranting on a, on a, from faculty when people say, where people say what they want in the name of academic freedom? So working in academic libraries, um, academic freedom is sometimes invoked as um, a background or a defense for um, sharing opinions. Anti-racist pushback fuels the hostiles or hostilities, only creating a more harmful environment for everyone reading the discussion. So that's a sort of specific instance with discussion lists um, causing harm as people are relying on academic freedom defense. But I think the academic freedom, freedom defense is also something that um, is, comes into play in a larger context as well sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so any thoughts on, and I'm rereading re the question, on how to deal with objectionable ranting. Um, again, it comes back to positionality. So it's what, what kind of privilege do you hold as someone who is in that chat? Um, are you experiencing harm? Are you experiencing discomfort, right? Potentially, are you experiencing both? I think if harm is being experienced, right, then we have to have an understanding of like, what, what, what exactly is the harm and how is that harm being caused? Um, if you're in a group and there are a lot of folks who are talking about academic freedom and potentially they're speaking specifically about anti-racism, right, and they're offering education or they're sharing their, their personal lived experience. Um, if you're a white person, then I think there should be plenty of room for them to be able to do that. I think if you have um, black and brown folks or you know, indigenous folks are in a chat and potentially they're saying something that is harmful or violent, then I think that's another conversation. Um, but if it's just sort of like, this is uncomfortable and people don't like it, then there is no problem there. 
I think that if specifically if we're talking about like when you mentioned this comment around anti-racist pushback fuels the hostiles, it's actually not true, right? So we know that whether, whether there was pushback or not that was anti-racist, that um, people who feel very motivated by white supremacy culture, very motivated by the culture of um, racism, to be harmful will be. And me pushing back on that is not fueling that harm, right? It's not amplifying that harm. I'm actually holding accountability because I'm getting right into it, right? I'm intervening in that harm and I'm disrupting it. And so I think it really, because I don't know the full context of what's happening, those would be some of my first thoughts is asking ourselves that question. Is, is harm being experienced? Who is harm being experienced by, right? And how do we break down that harm? What are the positionalities of the folks that are causing the harm? What are the potentially causing the harm? And what are the positionalities of the folks who are potentially on the receiving end of that harm? Um, but yeah, without much context, that's how I would respond. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful perspective on it. Um, there's a question below that in the chat. Um, you mentioned study as important. Would a good way to begin be to have everyone read something different, <clears throat> excuse me, and then share? We need to get started with this impor important accountability, but budgets to plan events that cost money have been delayed, possibly in COVID circumstances. And many of us are wanting to get going now versus waiting. So that might be um, um, a very specific instance, but um, Asking, I think, generally about where to start, especially in a, a low or no budget situation. Sure. I think starting with those, um, with those dialogues is important and helpful. If there's a way that within the existing budget, where maybe you don't even have to reallocate anything, right? There doesn't have to be any reallocations, but you can actually dedicate an hour of actual work time where people are getting paid to having conversations about anti-racism, then I think you should try to do that. Um, in terms of people reading different things, I think it's potentially, depending on where folks are, like if you're just starting out, I think it's way better if everybody was reading the same thing and then talking about how they've experienced that text. Um, so I would start off with, I mean, there's plenty of now anti-racist reading lists that are going around. So I would think about that. I mean, I know that, again, I'm talking to, I'm preaching to the choir here when it comes to research, um, hopefully. But so when, when you were sort of thinking about that, there's plenty of, of lists that are going around. Um, there's plenty of listicles that focus specifically on, hey, if you're just starting in this work, this is what you should read. Um, and I think that the, your best bet would be to start with like reading one text and then going from there. I know a very common and popular text to read when folks are just sort of starting in the work um, is the, the, the piece by, what is it? I'm sorry, I'm just, I am trying to remember the name and I know, Everyone in this, or well, not everyone, but I know probably a lot of folks in this chat right now already know what I'm going to say, but I want to be sure that I remember. Oh, yes. So, so Emerging Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. Um, I know a lot of folks in organizations that I work with who started with that book and have found it to be a very, very effective sort of springboard for talking about other works that are specific to anti-racism. So that's something that I would consider. Thank you, that's really, really helpful. Um, I'm just reading through comments or um, pieces in chat. I really just wanna mention as well, as we're having this conversation, several people have been giving big props to the committee, the program committee for this year's program. And um, at least one person has said, this is the most amazing ACRL ALA program they have attended. So uh, I know you don't have a chance, everybody doesn't have a chance to look through all of the chat, but the, that is wonderful feedback for Mackenzie and the program committee. Thank you. Um, I am very, very happy to see that. Yeah. Um, can I read one? Absolutely. Um, this is from an anonymous person. Thank you, Mackenzie. As a Black librarian, your remarks and accountability for my own healing including leaving harmful situations really struck me. I'm currently having a career, career existential crisis because I work and have always worked in predominantly white institutions and feel that I should take my talents elsewhere where I can make more of an impact. That said, I occupy a senior role and feel pressured not to abandon the profession given that there are so few librarians of color, let alone in senior, in senior roles. And so I think the only way that I would respond to that to you, anonymous person, is by saying that, um, that I see you, um, that I validate your feelings around that and your feelings potentially around 
figuring out what you want to do, what you want your next steps to be. Um, and that I think that, you know, um, it's a hard decision to make. But also if you're feeling very sort of naturally drawn to doing something else, that has to be okay. Right, that has to be okay. Um, I think that sometimes we, you know, if we stay in something too long, we can get so burnt out that we don't want to do anything. And I think that especially can happen in predominantly white institutions when you're a black person, you're a brown person, you're a person of color. I think that can definitely happen. I think it's something that we should be um, highly sensitive to and something that we should really prioritize is how am I feeling? Am I feeling like really, really worn down? Do I feel like I have very, very limited capacity? Have I been feeling as if I have had limited capacity for years, for months, right? For, for too long, whatever that sort of amount of time is. Um, and then how can I sort of um, express this sort of accountability with self by you know, making a decision that's going to be best for whatever my mental, emotional, physical right, capacity is going to be. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much. Agreed. Thank you. And thank you for making the response, Mackenzie. I think it's time for us to um, turn this over to, to, to close this part of the program and turn this over to the open session. I wanted to close with one last question, which came from someone asking if it's all right for us to share the link to Mackenzie's Patreon account here for people who might want to provide direct support for their fabulous work. <laughs> I'm, I don't know if that's something that you wanted to um, include Mackenzie in today or if oh, it's something yeah, you'd fine. like people to just find online. That's fine if you all want to share that. Share okay. all the links. <laughs> okay, thanks. So thank you so much, Char, for uh, suggesting that. And that's now in the chat for anybody who might like to contribute. Um, I, I am very sorry to say that we are out of time for the session today. Thank you so much again, Mackenzie. Um, I concur with the folks who said what an absolutely fantastic um, mind opening, eye opening, heart opening, kick in the pants program you have given us. So very much appreciated. Uh, and you can see the thanks are just coming in on on the chat now. <laughs> So I will uh, just close with a last couple of logistical comments for everybody. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can continue to participate in the upcoming uh, ACRL Together Wherever events this week, as well as ALA Virtual Conference, Community Through Connection, which will be June 24th to 26th. Thanks to generous sponsors, ALA members can register for only $60 for this online event which is in educational programming, author events, and social networking. If you've been furloughed, laid off, or reduced, experiencing a reduction of paid work hours, you can join for no cost at all to those events as well. I hope you'll take advantage of those things. Uh, and I hope everyone stays safe, stays well. And uh, when this program with, with chat will be made available to participants so that you have the reading list, um, the, I hope everyone will take advantage of that and find ways to keep moving forward in your own institutions and in your lives. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you, committee and staff. Take care, and we will uh, talk to you soon. <laughs>